Good evening. We had an interesting meeting this afternoon, mainly for leaders and their wives. And uh, I talked about something which uh, is, is an objective fact. I make no god of education or theological education. I know people with theological educations that are on their way to hell. They're not even saved. You don't need a theological education in the academic sense to be a minister. But you do need to know the word of God. If somebody is unable to rightly divide the Word of God, they have no business whatsoever being a minister. That's what the Word of God says in 1 Timothy. No business whatsoever. Now, I'm not against theological education, but I was a, a missionary in the Middle East for years without one. I studied science as a kid. Only when I was older did I go to Britain and become educated in academic theology. I did know Hebrew, of course, but that was just a plus, a natural plus I had. I learned Greek and things like that later. In any event, it is an objective fact that the standards of education and biblical knowledge among Pentecostal and charismatic ministers are very, 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 very low. Extremely low. You're not simply dealing with men who are by and large uneducated academically. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is you're dealing with people who have never been taught the Word of God. The old-time Pentecostals were. They knew their Bibles and their doctrines much better. That's by and large gone. Now, this afternoon we had a minister who took exception when he saw the videos you're going to see tomorrow. We showed the videos of Rodney Brown and Kenneth Copeland and crazy things from around the world which we'll be showing here tomorrow. We certainly encourage you to join us and bring your friends. And he couldn't deny what he saw and I pointed out that the Pentecostal leadership in this country, including the Pentecostal leadership of his denomination, which was apostolic, brought this in. And he became very angry and disturbed until Philip held up the brochure showing that the general superintendent of the apostolic denomination endorsed Rodney Brown and was one of the people who brought him into this country. I mean, again, if you can't refute the message, you shoot the messenger. <laughs> Just like the Sanhedrin. I couldn't deal with what Jesus said. And then he was angry because I, I looked at Acts 3.19. And I said, let's look at Acts 3.19 which is what they're all saying. You see, they have a problem. The problem with the proponents of the Toronto phenomena, their first problem is they don't know what it is or how to define it biblically. They must admit that it's been around in America for going on three years, and Britain for two years, Australia for two years, New Zealand for two years, and it hasn't brought a real revival in the sense of Wesley's revivals or anything else. So they can't say it's a revival, but they admit that. Originally they said it was a revival, as you'll see in the videos tomorrow. Now they're saying it's not a revival, it's a time of refreshing. They've had to try to redefine it. And you'll see people on the videos tomorrow saying, if God can do this for me, if he can give it to me. Well, I ask, what is it? First of all, you know, what is it? This one man up there in, in the airport vineyard church in Toronto was saying, if God can set me free, well, set free of what? You can use the term set free when somebody's born again. We're set free from the power of sin and death. But the man already was born again, so he couldn't be talking about that. Then most of the people who are involved in all of the people are already charismatic to Pentecostals. They're already people who claim to be baptized in the spirit or have had a spirit baptism. So they obviously can't be talking about spirit baptism. Thirdly, it's not a revival, so I must ask, what is it? And the answer I usually get is Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a charismatic, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, I practice them. But the text does not say that a time of refreshing precedes repentance. It says that repentance precedes refreshing. No place does the word of God say that a refreshing is the predecessor of revival. No place. Not even one place. It says the opposite. First comes the repentance, then God will refresh you. Again, it's bad enough that these people can't read Greek or Hebrew, but they can't even read English. More than that, in the verse, in the context, Peter is talking to unsaved people, not to Christians. The whole thing is absurd. Absolutely absurd. What is it? Well, anyway, he was angry that I said anybody who reads a verse like this 
is behaving like a moron. And I found out later they were grumbling because they couldn't refute what I said, that uh, Jesus said, call no man fool. I didn't say fool, I said moron. M-O-R-O-N. Fool is raka in Aramaic. As in the fool says in his heart there is no God. I didn't say these people were atheists. I said what, what Paul said, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? And believe me, these people caught up in these things you'll see tomorrow on the videos of being bewitched. They're being spiritually seduced, the Hebrew term, makshafut. In any event, let us look at the golden calf that Philip read from Exodus chapter 32. We have to understand the first thing about a golden calf is, it is always an alien spirit pretending to be Yahweh. A golden calf is always an alien spirit, a foreign god, something demonic, pretending to be the true god. This is the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. They confused the golden calf with Yahweh. A better example is what happened with the priests of Baal. In the Baal worship of the ancient Near East, which was a Canaanite fertility cult, once again, a calf becomes a picture of their God, who they confuse with Yahweh. The priests of Baal did not begin worshipping this Canaanite Baal. Let me give you a brief lesson in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word for husband is Baal. Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal. The true Baal of heaven, Baal of Shemaim, was Yahweh. But the, he, the priest of Baal, under the influences of Jezebel, who's a picture of the spirit of false religion in Revelation, begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way. You begin to worship the true God in an unbiblical way. That's how Baal worship began. They didn't begin worshipping a foreign Baal, they began worshipping the true one, Yahweh. But instead of worshipping him on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where God ordained, they began worshipping him, rather, in what we call in Hebrew, Beimot, high places. And another spirit, an alien spirit, got in and began counterfeiting the true God. That's what happens. That's what always happens. Now again, Leviticus chapter 10 calls this burning strange fire. And I was astounded that, the, uh, that, that, that a member of the executive of the Assemblies of God in Australia, Philip, Philip Hills, actually says a little bit of strange fire is better than no fire. I wish he'd read the book of Leviticus. But God says that's dangerous and it will bring judgment. But this is what the Assemblies of God is teaching these days in Australia. First Corinthians 4, 6 says, Do not exceed the things of the written. Don't do that. Paul says it directly. However, about a month before last, John Wimber said, there is no biblical basis for what is happening at the Airport Vineyard Church in Toronto. This is what John Wimber, the leader of the Vineyard, says. We should just accept it anyway. Now, who are you going to believe? The Word of God or, or John Wimber, the leader of the Vineyard? They're saying things that are contradictory. Once you exceed the things that are written, you fall into man-made doctrine. That's what Laodicea means, people's opinions. We just talked about that last night. You begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way, and an alien spirit gets in. The priests of Baal were unable to make the real fire fall. It didn't happen. Now, Elijah made it fall. He rebuilt something we call in Hebrew, Mesabeach, the ancient altar. Hebrews lets us know that an altar in the Old Testament is a type of the cross of Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, and when he dies on the cross, that is prefigured in the Old Testament by the high priest making atonement on the altar. Elijah was able to make the fire fall. How? He rebuilt the ancient altar. Any time the fire ever fell in the history of the church, it was because of the preaching of the cross. That was always the central message. The early Pentecostals, the fire really fell. Large numbers were saved. But what was their message? Was their message the Holy Spirit? No, it wasn't. Was the message signs and wonders? No, it wasn't. The message of early Pentecostalism was this power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. They preached the cross. John Wesley, his whole message was holiness, repentance, the cross. The book of Acts, this Jesus whom you crucified. It has no resemblance to what you see today. 
In Wesley's revivals, in the book of Acts, in early Pentecostalism, huge numbers of people were being saved. That is not happening now. On the contrary, when unsaved people see 60 Minutes or the BBC and they see these excesses, it makes them want to not become Christians rather than causing them to want to become Christians. It prevents revival. It doesn't bring it. If the unsaved enter, will they not say you are mad? As we'll look at that tonight. Elijah made the fire fall by going back to the ancient altar. The only way real revival will come, that real Holy Ghost fire will fall and purify and bring revival to the church in this nation and restore it to any degree to its biblical heritage, is the people go back to the cross. But these people don't want the cross. Just look at the videos tomorrow and see for yourself. They could be less interested in the cross. Their message is not the one of Wesley. It's not the one of early Pentecostalism. It's not the one of the book of Acts. Instead, it's the priests of Baal. They had their cast, so they ranted and raved and tried to make the fire fall. They ranted and raved and behaved like lunatics. But the fire didn't fall. So they ranted and raved some more and behaved like lunatics even more excessively. And the fire didn't fall. And if you want to see lunatics, come and see the videos tomorrow that we watched this afternoon. Just like the priests of Baal, they can't make the fire fall, so they behave like lunatics. They had a calf cult. It was a calf. Golden calves spring up many times in Israel's history because they spring up many times in the history of the church. As we looked at this afternoon, the early Christians called Toronto-type phenomena Montanism. During the Reformation, the Munster Anabaptists did the same things in Germany, the same kind of nuttiness. The founders of the Quakers, George Fox's followers, the witness of the inner light and the quaking, it was the same thing. None of this is new. None of it. In vineyard churches in the United States, the same thing was going on 10, 12 years ago. Only then they said it was deliverance from demons. Now they're saying they made a mistake 10 years ago. It's the Holy Ghost. None of it's new. None of it. Absolutely none of it is without precedent. Many golden calves. Second Kings 10.29, a golden calf. Hosea 8, 5 and 6, a golden calf. Hosea 13.2, a golden calf. The Montanists, a golden calf. The Munster Anabaptists, a golden calf. They always spring up at pivotal times in church history. None of this is without precedent. It's in the Old Testament and it's throughout history of the church as well as the history of Israel. But tonight we're going to look at two stories of golden calves, the two main ones, the one in Exodus, then we'll have a five-minute break, and we'll look at, Lord willing, the one in Kings. This calf worship, the bull cults, in Egypt were associated with the worship of Apis and Nevis. But in the land of Goshen, where the Jews were captive, it was associated with Horus worship. In Canaan, it became associated with Baal worship. We have to understand what exactly is happening here when Moses goes to get the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This period of time, when Moses goes to get the Ten Commandments, is called in Judaism the Sira, literally the counting. It is the period between the Jewish Feast of Pesach, Passover, and the Jewish Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. The rabbis tell us that the Torah was given on the day of Pentecost. The same day the Holy Spirit was given is when the Torah was given to Moses when this happened. Now you have to understand that. This period is when the Jews have made so many of their biggest mistakes, such as following a false messiah who's a type of the Antichrist called Simon Bar Kokhba. They made a lot of mistakes at this time period. But this is the first. Moses tells the people at this time in the Jewish year, the same time of year, you wait, I'm going to get something. Jesus tells his disciples, you wait, I'm going to get something. Same time. The rabbis tell us in the Talmudic literature that when the Torah was given, they deduced it somehow from the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 that a whirlwind was heard from heaven. 
and 30 tongues, Lasha notes, were heard when a Torah was given. So the phenomena of tongues, glossolalia in Greek, is heard in the Old Testament when, tongue, when the Torah is given, according to the rabbis. And when the New Testament comes, and the Holy Spirit is given, the same phenomena recurs. Tongues. Only the difference being the following. When the Torah was given, 3,000 fell. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. You understand? The right action of the apostles is seen as a reversal of the wrong action of Aaron and the children of Israel. You understand? The early Christians understood tongues partly this way. They saw it as a partial reversal of the curse of Babel, the Tower of Babel. God's judgment came separating nations on the basis of language. But through unity in Christ, that unity is partly restored. That's how they understood tongues in part in the early church. Now, the Torah is given and 3,000 fall. The Spirit is given. 3,000 are saved. Moses tells the children of Israel, wait. But they get rambunctious. And instead of waiting for the real thing, they make a golden calf. Something which is an alien spirit counterfeiting the true God. The apostles, however, wait. God's definition of waiting, however, is very, very different than ours. Our definition of waiting works like this. Hanging around, waiting for a train, drinking coffee, when's the train coming? God's version of waiting is entirely different. His version of waiting always entails action. Always. Being faithful to what you already have. First of all, it's prayer. The apostles were given to prayer and fasting, waiting for the Spirit to fall. Our prayer and fasting will always be effective in what happens in the heavenlies, as we see in the book of Daniel. We have a role to play in God's dynamic. Now, some people go overboard with this and get into all kinds of crazy teaching, like Peter Wagner, but that's nuts. There is a biblical truth, however. Now, secondly... God's idea of waiting always entails being faithful to what you already have and taking care of the business at hand the way the apostles were looking for a replacement for Judas at this period during the Sphira. Let's see what God's idea of waiting means. If you want the real thing to happen, wait. But what does wait mean? Remember what John Wesley said when he saw this kind of Toronto phenomena in his day. This is a satanic deception and a satanic counterfeit sent by the devil to disrupt what God is really wanting to do. That was Wesley's conclusion. Make no mistake about it. There are churches where God is working. The Holy Spirit is wanting to do something. If that was not the case, the devil would not raise up false teachers like Randy Clark and John Arnott and, 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 and these other people and Rodney Brown to do this at this time. He wouldn't make a golden calf at this time if God was not really wanting to do something authentic and genuine. But let's look. Wait. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Verse 7, So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. They're getting ready now for the Decalogue to be given, but Moses was already given commandments. All that God has spoken we will do. Until we are acting on the word of God, until we are already being faithful to what God has already given us in his word, he's not going to do anything else. Not until we act on what we already have will God do anything further. Our sojourning in this world is prefigured, according to 1 Corinthians 10, by the sojourning of the Jews in the wilderness. Moses is a type of Jesus, isn't he? Pharaoh is a type of the devil, the god of this world. In 1 Corinthians 10, just as Moses makes the covenant with blood and sprinkles it on the people, so does Jesus. As Moses leads the Hebrews out of Egypt, a figure of the world, through the water, 
through the wilderness into the promised land is the way Jesus leads us out of the world through baptism into heaven. But the sojourning in the wilderness is a picture of our sojourning in this world. They had the Shekinah, the Shekinah, Harawak Kodesh, the spirit of holiness. And the Holy Spirit was moving in the cloud and in the fire. Sometimes it would move with works and signs of awesome power. Sometimes it would hover. Sometimes in the history of the church we see God moving dynamically, but sometimes he doesn't. But whether or not the Shekinah moved, the manna fell every day. The bread was always there. When did the people stop moving? When the Shekinah didn't. When did the Shekinah stop moving? When the people stopped being faithful to what they already had. One of the main characteristics of the charismatic movement after 30 years is that it has not been faithful to the Word of God. I honestly believe it began as an authentic move of God's Spirit. But at an early point, it sold out, it was betrayed by its leaders into the deception of ecumenism and compromise. After 30 years, look at the facts. There's no less crime, no less divorce, no less homosexuality, no less racism. Society is far worse off now than it was before the charismatic renewal. Why? Because the church is far worse off now than it was before the charismatic renewal. As I pointed out yesterday, I live in England. Thirty years ago, you wouldn't have found bishops denying the resurrection or the virgin birth. You wouldn't have found a once upon a time evangelical archbishop marching in a procession to Mary as you do now. The church is worse off after 30 years of renewal. How can the society be anything but worse off? The main reason the charismatic movement has failed so categorically, the first reason, Satan has torpedoed every charismatic renewal in the history of the church the same way. Experiential theology. People basing their doctrines on feelings and experience and subjective revelation to the negation of what's in God's word. And you see this today with people like Jill Austin. People trying to give us New Age philosophy in Christian masquerade. It's all New Age. It is not Christianity. Only the packaging. She set the stage for the deceptions of Toronto in this nation. She was sent by the vineyard ahead of time. Until we act on what we already have, God will do nothing further. His version of waiting requires action. Secondly, let's look further. Verse 10, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, consecrate them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. Let the people wash their garments. Repentance. Consecration. Unless there is a re-emphasis on holiness and sanctification, God will not work. This church is the church of the Nazarene. Like any other church I know of, it has its strong points and its weak points. One of its strong points is it has a proper emphasis on holiness and sanctification. Until there is an emphasis on holiness and sanctification, God will not work. I do not see any of that evident in any of the teaching associated with Toronto. In fact, I don't see any teaching associated with it, except for people taking verses out of context, which you'll see tomorrow. To understand this, we have to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that may be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of trumpets and the sound of words which sound with such that those who heard begged that no further word should be spoken to them. When somebody has a real encounter with the holiness of God, it's an awesome, frightful thing. They didn't want to hear anymore. Look at being slain in the spirit in the Bible. Look when it really happens. Like when Jesus cast the demon out of the kid, and they think he's dead. Look at John chapter 1. John is in the spirit in the Lord's day, and he falls as if slain. One, he falls on his face. Daniel falls on his face. Any place the real thing happens, they always fall forward. The only time anybody fell backward is when they came to arrest Jesus, and God put his power on him to throw them back. 
In the Bible, they always fall forward. Secondly, they always tremble. They don't roll and laugh hysterically. And thirdly, they're different when they get up than when they go down. What you see today is a lot of rubbish. It's just not biblical. A real encounter with God brings a sense of His holiness. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. People don't want to have a real encounter with God because they would realize their sin. Look at Peter, depart from him, a sinful man. The Apostle John knew Jesus. He was physically related to Jesus. When he saw Jesus in his manifest glory, he was terrified. The closer you get to the light, the more cognizant you are of the dirt. God is awesome and holy. People don't want holiness. They don't want to behold his real power, so they make a golden calf that's going to let them laugh. What does Paul say? Wanting to have their ears tickled, they will turn aside from truth and accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own carnal desires. And these teachers will come in the character of Jonas and Jambres, Pharaoh's magicians who did counterfeit signs and wonders, Paul tells us. If possible, the elect will be deceived, Jesus said, and they'll be deceived by false signs and wonders. As Jesus said, a wicked generation seeks a sign. I believe in signs when they're practiced biblically. But when you find people seeking a sign, seeking a manifestation, Jesus said that is wickedness. You watch these videos tomorrow, you'll see people seeking signs. Jesus said they're seeking after wickedness. That's what Jesus said. Let's look further. These people talk about getting an anointing. First of all, these people do not know what an anointing is. Different liquids typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his being and ministry. Maim Hayim in Hebrew, living water is the Holy Spirit outpoured, as in Isaiah 44, 3, or as in John 7, 38 and 39. This he spoke of the Spirit. It comes in John 7 from what we call in Hebrew, Simcha Bet the temple ritual was pouring out water on the temple mount at the Jewish Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot. It's a picture of the millennia in Ezekiel 47. All these people who are telling you the water's up to here, then up to here, then up to here, it's a lot of rubbish. They don't understand what Sim Kabet the Shoiva means in Judaism. It's about the millennia, a separate subject. Nonetheless, living water is the spirit outpoured, but it's the spirit. Isaiah 24, 7, new wine is the Holy Spirit in worship but it's the Holy Spirit, new wine. But shemen, oil, shemen in Hebrew, is the anointing of the Spirit. All of these liquids are the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a he, he is not an it. You cannot grieve in it, you cannot blaspheme in it. They are calling a he an it. If anybody is blaspheming the Spirit, it's these people doing this, except they're doing it in ignorance, most of them. The Holy Spirit is God, and he's worshipped in the context of the Trinity. Nowhere is the Holy Spirit ever prayed to in the Bible except when he's worshipped as a member of the triunity of the Godhead. All of this stuff, come Holy Spirit, good morning Holy Spirit, not one of it has one single speck of biblical basis. It's people who don't know what they're talking about writing their own Bibles, like Andrew Evans, the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Australia, or Benny Hinn of these people. But it has no basis in the Word of God. None. None. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus. Let's look at this idea of anointing in Acts 2, which they all quote from but never seem to read. We'll look at two verses in Acts 2, Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you see and hear. But then in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, that is Christ, this Jesus, or Yeshua, whom you crucified. Notice, first of all, it talks about the anointing in conjunction with crucifixion. The Lord Jesus was anointed for burial before he was anointed for power, wasn't he? 
What was St. Paul's proof of his anointing as an apostle? His miracles were real, unlike the leg pulling you see today. His miracles were real, but that was never the proof of his anointing. The churches he planted, they were never the proof of his anointing. All the people saved, not bogus figures like you see today, he had real conversion. But that was not the proof of his anointing. Was it the books of the Bible he wrote? No, that was not the proof of his anointing. Paul's proof of his anointing as an apostle was the stigmata. He was anointed for burial. I bear the marks of Christ on my body. It was a crucified life that was the proof of his anointing. Jesus was anointed for burial before he was power. If you are not seeing a crucified life, you are not seeing an anointed vessel. I don't care how much power they seem to have. Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yeah, you did. Get lost. That's what Jesus said. But let's look. Look at verse 36 again. The Lord has made him Messiah. That means anointed one, Christ. Who was anointed? Christ. Jesus is the anointed one. Nobody has an anointing. You hear what I said? Nobody has an anointing. He has it. To understand what this text is saying, you have to understand Psalm 133, the Jewish concept of anointing. Look at Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2. Everybody look at it. If you're on the Bible, share a Bible with the person next to you. Please. Look at Psalm 133. It begins by talking about unity. Hine matob umanayin shevet achim gam yachad. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Then it says, it's like precious oil upon the beard, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. Aaron, the high priest, is a picture of who in Hebrews? Who's Aaron a picture of? Hebrews. The high priest is a picture, a type of who? Jesus. Jesus is a high priest. The oil is poured on Aaron's head, and it goes off his head onto the members of his body, doesn't it? On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out on Jesus. He's the head of the body. And it goes off the head onto the rest of the body. We're the members. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Therefore shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Feet are evangelists. You can be a very good evangelist, an excellent foot, but it's no good in the corner. It must be attached to the body and under the head to be anointed. You understand? The eye is the lamp. This is Midrash, the Jewish way of interpreting scripture. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is sound, the body will be sound also. Why? Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It gives light to the body. Teachers. The New Testament contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. You know why? Because if you don't have right doctrine, you won't know what right conduct is. So have born-again Catholics praying in tongues to Mary, which is an abomination, praying to the dead, and people like Phil Zabritsky saying that's all right. The eye is sound, the body will be sound also. But for the eye to be of any value, it must be attached to the body and under the head. Only Jesus was anointed on Pentecost. Our anointing comes from being attached to his body and under his headship. If somebody is not under the headship of Christ, they have no anointing because the oil can only come from the head. Now, King Saul was indeed God's anointed. David wouldn't touch him in the cave of Ein Gedi. I won't touch God's anointed. Whenever you find these guys teaching error, things directly contrary to scripture or catch them in a swindle touch not my anointed that becomes their defense I'm immune no King David would never touch Saul but did that ever stop David or the prophet Samuel from telling the truth about Saul no Therefore, it should not stop you from telling the truth about people like Benny Hinn and Rodney Brown and Kenneth Copeland. That's assuming they're God's anointed, which is a big doubt in itself. But even if they were. 
That's not what touched on my anointed means. No, David wouldn't touch him, but David sure told the truth about him. I wish these silly people would read the Bible before they try to quote from it. But then again, they're charismatics and Pentecostals whose leaders don't even know any better. How can I expect anything from the poor people? They don't know what anointing is. Let's look at Exodus 30:30. 30, 30. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister as priests to me. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. Pay attention. It shall not be poured on anyone's head, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy and shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it or puts any of it on the head of a layman shall be cut off from his people. It's holy. Holy in Hebrew, mekudeshet lecha, literally, set apart by God unto you. Whatever your anointing is from Jesus, whatever oil drips off of him unto you, is holy unto you, set apart by God unto you. Mekudeshet lecha. It's an abomination to try to give your anointing to somebody else. Do you see that? We can lay hands on the sick and pray for their healing when the Lord leads. We can lay hands on people, commissioning them for ministry. As in Acts 13, we can pray for spirit baptism. But to try to give your anointing to somebody else, God says it's an abomination. Yet we have people taking your tithes and offerings to go to Toronto to get somebody else's so-called anointing, thousands and thousands of dollars in airfare, to bring it back and give it to you. And you're paying for it. And God says it's an abomination. When Elijah was asked by Elisha, give me your mantle. Elisha said, said, give me your mantle. Elijah said, I can't give that to you. You wait here. The mantle had to fall from the chariot. Only God can give it. He couldn't give it to him. Only God can give it. Tomorrow you'll see the video of David Sherman of the Assemblies of God, who was brought into this country by Wayne Hughes of the Assemblies of God, saying, if you want a double portion of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Come up here and touch the hem of my garment. The age of Elijah is over. It's a new age. You want the spirit? Come up and touch my coat. And the executive of the Assemblies of God, followed by a stampede of Assemblies of God ministers, and I am Assemblies of God, come up, kneel down, and touch his coat. This is an abomination. And the AOG leadership in this country tried to hide it from the people and bring it into this country without anybody challenging it, even though they knew about it. That's the kind of thing that goes on these days. The word of God is not respected because God himself is not respected. If the word of God is not being respected, it means that God himself is not being respected. It's an abomination. Yet these people are saying, get it, get it, get it. What is it? The anointing of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself. He is not an it. Secondly, it is nekudeshet lacha. It is yours. You can't give it to somebody else, and somebody else can't give theirs to you. It must drip off the head onto the body. But let's look further. Look at Exodus 33, verse 2. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. I will not go up in your midst because you are obstinate people, lest I destroy you on the way. Where the people get the perverted idea that because God is doing something, because God is on the move, that it means he's with us. God says, I'm going to do these things for my glory, for my name's sake. I'm going to do these things, but it's nothing to do with you. It doesn't mean I'm with you. If I was with you, I would destroy you, he said. Lord, do we not do miracles in your name? Maybe for God's own glory and for the good of others, he's using them. But Jesus never said you'd know them by their gifts. He said you'd know them by their fruits. Don't tell me a prosperity preacher who will go up to an old lady who's dying, living on a pension. The only thing she has left is her faith in Jesus. As she prepares to leave this fallen world, the only thing she has left is her faith in Jesus. And one of these con artists from America says, no, you don't even have that. You don't even have faith in Jesus, otherwise you'd be healed because he's perverting scripture. 
That's not the fruit of the Spirit. What's more, he's doing it to suck money out of us. These people are the lowest of the low. Their message is from hell, not from God. I don't say people don't get healed. But for his own glory and the good of others, God will use who God will. I will not go in your midst, even though the signs will be there. Depart from me, I never knew you, he says. Where do they get this idea? They're looking at the gifted and the gift instead of the gift tour. They've got it all wrong. Let's continue. Remember, when they make this golden calf, something was happening. God was about to do something. Whenever you see a golden calf like Toronto, it's because the devil knows God is really doing something. The Reformation, God was really going to do something. So you have the Munster Anabaptists going bananas. It's always been like that. Yes, God is working and moving and preparing and wanting to do something. That's why you have this. Forget about there's a baby in the bathwater. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's two different paths. Derek Prince, on his latest tape, modifies his previous position in that booklet, which he has certain regrets about if you heard his latest tape. And he warns that the Jews were not to make a garment out of flax and wool. God hates a mixture. If there's a mixture, it's no good. Get rid of it, says Derek Prince. Derek Prince is right. I don't always agree with him, but I usually agree with him. And in this case, he's right. But let's look further. Why does Aaron do it? Why in Exodus 32 does Aaron do it? That's simple. Aaron does it because of popular pressure. Why do most ministers who've gone into Toronto, why have they done it? Popular pressure. All the other ministers are doing it, and they're afraid they'll lose people to the other churches, so they do it. People in their church begin to say they're having it over there, and it's the move of God, we want it. Instead of going to the Lord and examining God's word, they give in to popular pressure. Remember this, if you remember nothing else tonight, remember this. When people fear man, it means they are not fearing God. When people fear man, it means they are not fearing God. Popular pressure. That's why they're doing it. That's why Aaron did it. That's why they always make a golden calf. And they make a feast which looks biblical but is unbiblical. Remember, a golden calf counterfeits the real God. The priests of Baal thought they were worshipping the true Baal. Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal, Israel's husband. Idolatry is called adultery in the Bible. The Hebrew word is znut, whoredom or harlotry. When Israel goes into idolatry, God calls it znut, whoredom. Oh, daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot, this kind of thing. Israel's Baal was to be Yahweh. But they get into another Baal who counterfeits him. That's what a golden calf always is. What do the people say to Aaron? This is the God who brought you out of Egypt. The priest of Baal thought that the Baal calf cult was the real God. Once you begin to worship the true God in an unbiblical way, an alien spirit gets in and counterfeits him. Do not exceed the things which are written. Do not burn strange fire. But let's continue. They make a feast, we're told. Celebration praise. The whole thing begins to get staged. Now look at the next verse 6. So at this feast, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That is a bad translation. It doesn't say in the Hebrew original that they rose up to play. It says they rose up to laugh. Is there holy laughter in the Bible? Yes, Isaac, it's not. He shall laugh. There's holy laughter. 
But Hebrew has different kinds of verb structures, seven different ones, and there's two here that are important. A PL and a KAL. A PL is a heavy structure and a KAL is a light one. If the people laughed spontaneously, if it was holy laughter, God would have done something and it would have been spontaneous laughter. It would say the people rose up to lit hope, lit hope, like we get Isaac, Yitzhak, he shall laugh. If it was spontaneous laughter, if it was something that happened as a result of what God did, it would, have, it would say the people rose up to lit hope. It doesn't say that. It's not a call, call verb. It's a different infinitive. The people rose up to let the heck. Let the heck is a PL structure of the infinitive. It means a contrived, predetermined, foreplanned effort organized to fulfill the purpose of the verb. In other words, the laughter was staged, manipulated. When the people rise up to laugh and God does it, they just rise up and God would make them laugh. It would be lit hook. Here it's left the heck. It's manipulated. It's staged. Watch the videos for yourself tomorrow. That's what happened in the book of Exodus 32, and that's what's going on today. Manipulation, hypnotic induction. As I told you yesterday, if I was to put on a video of a stage hypnotist like Paul McKenna, or Ori Geller over here, and put on a video of Benny Hinn or Rodney Brown over here, you would not be able to tell the difference. They would be doing the same thing by hypnotic induction and psychological predisposition. It's the same. The only difference is people like Rodney Brown, by twisting Bible verses out of context, are combining hypnotic induction with spiritual seduction. That's the only difference. It is a counterfeit. The people rose up to laugh. Staged laughter. But let's continue. We're then told that the people corrupted themselves. And in verse 9, the people are obstinate. Obstinate. Obstinance in the Bible is called also makshafut, witchcraft. This hypnotic induction is witchcraft, but when people persist in it, rebellion is also witchcraft. Makshafut, the same word in Hebrew. Anyone seeing the videos we watch today that would persist and say it's God is either someone who is very stupid or very rebellious or a combination of the two. Nobody who's looking at Jesus and believing the word of God can watch those videos and say this is his spirit. Nobody. But they're obstinate. When we show these videos, as we did today, you find four kinds of people. You find people who will always believe this Toronto thing was a counterfeit, and they have their suspicions reinforced. Then you have people who are on the fence. They weren't sure. It might be it's a mixture of good and bad. After seeing the videos, they're sure it's bad. Any truth in it? Of course there is. There's always real cheese in the rat trap. What's it say in First Peter chapter 2, verse 1? False teachers and false prophets will arise, secretly introducing heresies. That word is parasogzusin in Greek. It means they lay truth aside to error, the way Satan did. Of course there's some truth in Kenneth Copeland's teaching or Rodney Brown's teaching. The devil is much too clever to tell an obvious lie. His lies are perversions of truth. Prosperity theology is a perversion of a truth. Kingdom now theology is a perversion of a truth. Ecumenism is a perversion of a truth. They secretly introduce heresies. They parasozusin. They lay truth aside to error and get you to swallow the whole thing. Two pieces of bread. First the mustard, then tomato, then lettuce, then cheese, then meat. Good sandwich. But then in the middle you put some arsenic. Bon appetit. Palace of Zusen. Rodney Brown. Let's continue. The people are obstinate. They persist in a rebellion. The other kinds of people who see this video, people who are into Toronto and get converted out of it. 
when they see the leaders and the people, what they're teaching. You see, you've always had extremism. In the early days of Pentecostalism, you had people who went off the deep end. You always had that. But it wasn't the main leaders. Wesley put an end to it. Now it's the main leaders advocating that theopomorphic men imitate chimpanzees like John Honest. Come tomorrow, see the videos. I'll tell you a brief story. A little less than a year ago, I was in the jungle in Indonesia. I had these big coconuts. And you had to hit the curtain, not like the ones you get in the supermarket. They were big things with six husks. And you had to hit the things with a machete three or four times to get the top off, to get the juice out. And I was in one of these platforms with a thatched roof built on silk over the water, like you might see in Asia, Southeast Asia. And there's people pounding on drums up in the jungle. And somebody says, come here, you have to see this. So I go up into the bush, and there's these people pounding on drums. And they begin doing erotic dances. The dance steps, obviously, were somehow sexually connotated. And some of them put on masks of demons, like, and grotesque faces and dragons and things. And they begin doing these dances, even more erotically, pounding on the drums. And I was told they're calling down the spirits. The spirits are going to manifest. But when the spirits manifest, I couldn't believe it. They take the masks off. This one guy gets down in front of me. I wanted to make sure it was not raised the now, sleight of hand. It wasn't. He picks up a wedge of glass about the size of the palm of your hand, and right in front of me, he eats it. No blood. Then he picks up one of these husks. He gets down. You know, you have these orangutans in, in Indonesia. He gets down like he's a gorilla or a monkey or something. And he picks up one of these huge coconuts. And right in front of me, he grips the thing to bits with his teeth. And I mean, you know, you hack these things with a machete. He's doing it with his teeth. He does something that not only a monkey would do, something only a monkey could do. I was told... That's the monkey spirit. I said, what? That's the monkey spirit. Now, I was into the occult before I was saved. I've seen a lot of weird stuff, but this is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I've never saw anything quite like a human being imitating an animal and engaging in animal-like behavior that only animals could do. I never saw anything like it before. Until I got off the plane in London at Heathrow and went to Holy Trinity Brompton. Not only did I see the monkey spirit, I saw the French poodle spirit. <laughs> I think this guy had the platypus spirit. <laughs> there was a woman down on the floor clucking her arms like this and clucking like a chicken. I was told this is laying an egg for Jesus because God has had something new. <laughs> I said, what do you call this? They so said... Revival. I said, what? He said, revival. So what are you trying to revive? The Windsor Zoo? What are you, nuts? I was saved in a revival. I saw guys coming back from Vietnam totally strung out on heroin, no cold turkey, no withdrawal, giving their lives to Jesus in droves. People totally into acid trips, acid in the cult. Crazy. We were bomb firebombing police cars during the Vietnam War. There was a revival among hippies called the Jesus Movement. Forget about thousands saved. Forget about tens of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of these kids began getting saved in droves. Nobody could understand it. The result, it revolutionized evangelical North America. The biggest churches like Calvary Chapel. You can call these ex hippies and such. That's what it is. All these things like Christ for the Nation, Use of the Mission, it all came from this. I saw a real revival. Don't tell me this stupid garbage is revival. This is not revival. I was saved in a revival. I saw what revival is. This has nothing to do with revival. Then you have the people who remain in Toronto when they see these videos. They still believe it because they're obstinate, but they somehow lose their capacity to persuade other people who have seen the videos to take the quote-unquote blessing. Those are the four types. Why the people knew Toronto was wrong and then have the proof of the pudding. They're divided and not sure, then they're sure it's wrong. They're into Toronto, but they get converted out of it, or they stay in it, but they've lost their capacity to persuade others. Come, bring your friends, let them see the videos for themselves.
Bring your friends and neighbors and families into Toronto. Let them see the videos for themselves. Some videos we couldn't show you. We can show you pastors having convulsions, women beginning to rip their clothes off. We can show you that stuff. There's other stuff that's unfit to be seen publicly. Christian women down on the floor having sexual orgasms in church saying it's the Holy Spirit. If you contest this, of course, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The big scandal we have in London now, the London Healing Mission at Toronto meetings, the women were told to remove their knickers, come forward, and have Holy Communion wine poured on their genitals to drive the demons out. The minister's in jail. This is in all the newspapers. Some of this stuff, obviously, we wouldn't want anybody to see. But some, just come tomorrow, you, what you'll see is bad enough. You'll see John Arnott. You'll see him praying for somebody who begins screaming like a madman, falling on his back, yelling like he's being tortured. You'll see Randy Clark. You'll see stuff you wouldn't believe tomorrow. Bring your friends. Watch the videos for yourself. Who was here this afternoon and saw some of the videos? Am I telling you the truth? Bring your friends. But the people are obstinate. Some people will choose rebellion. Joshua comes down the mountain with Moses and Caleb. And what happens? There's a sound of war in the camp, but it's not the sound of triumph. Not the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry. Isn't that what it says? They're trying to make believe it's the song of war. But the text says there is no war. They're just having a party. A carnal party. Watch what happens next. How do we react? How did Moses react? The first thing Moses does is this. The true leaders come. Moses and Joshua come down the mountain. What does Moses do? He takes the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the Word of God, you broke it. This is unbiblical. You broke it. Show me where it's scriptural. You broke it. The first thing you people need to do who know this deception is deception is throw down the word of God and make them deal with it. But they cannot. What's the next thing Moses does? He smashes their golden calf and rubs their face in it. He makes them drink it in public, doesn't he? As we pointed out this afternoon, in the name of love, we stop loving. We have a stupid, unbiblical version of love today, where instead of the pastors, instead of the shepherds protecting the sheep from the wolves, they protect the wolves. Instead of protecting the sheep from the wolves and feeding the sheep, they feed the sheep to the wolves. These are not shepherds. These are hirelings. Ezekiel 34 warns about them. John warns about them. When people persisted in leading the church astray, Paul named them. Watch out for Alexander. Watch out for Hymenaeus. The Apostle John warns, look out for the ultra thieves, they're teaching error. The Gospels name the religious leaders who led the people astray. Caiaphas, look out. Herod, don't tell that fox he's a sneak, Jesus said. Ezekiel, look out for Jaius Naya, he's leading the people into false worship. Jeremiah, Look out for Hananiah. He's making predictions that don't happen in the name of the Lord. He's a false prophet and never a sheker. If the Old Testament prophets had this stupid idea that we don't stand up and confront leaders by name in public who don't repent and continue to mislead God's people, Jesus never would have been born because Israel would have been subverted. If the apostles had this unbiblical idea, there'd be no church today. Satan would have torpedoed it in the first century. Thank God that Paul and Peter and John loved the sheep instead of the wolves. If the pre-Nicene fathers, the patristic writers like Irenaeus had this idea, there'd be no church today, Satan would have torpedoed it in the second century. If the reformers, for all their later mistakes, if the reformers, if Erasmus and Luther and Calvin, if they didn't stand up against the Pope of the Middle Ages, we'd all be going to Mass today. Thank God that they went by the Bible instead of by the standards of social etiquette. 
The Bible treats leaders differently than it does ordinary people. Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. When we stand before Jesus, because I'm told I have the gift of teaching and I'm stupid enough to believe it, I am going to be more accountable than you. I'm going to be judged more strictly than you on the day of judgment. It's an awesome thing. Teachers. Jesus was very gracious with tax gatherers and harlots, thieves. But Matthew 23, when it came to the religious leaders who persisted in misleading God's people, he told them they were a generation of snakes. You don't deal with shepherds the way you deal with sheep. And you don't deal with hirelings the way you deal with shepherds. Moses rubbed their face in it. Look at the people who are promoting this. As I told you, the people promoting it in Great Britain are the same people who bought in the last vineyard deception, which was called Kansas City. John Wimber, Paul Kane, Mike Fickle, Bob Jones, who was caught in immorality, they predicted the greatest revival in Britain's history was coming five years ago, in October of 1990. All these same churches in the Toronto, Sandy Miller at the Holy Trinity Brompton, and David Pitches, you'll see the video of him, he's nuts, at, at, at St. Andrew's Trolleywood, they were all hyped up saying the revival's coming. In the five years since the last vineyard false promise of revival, Kansas City, that was the one before Toronto, we've had more mosques built in England than churches. I'll say it. Come here, John Wimber. You prophesied falsely in God's name. You made God's people trust in a lie, the same as Hananiah did in Jeremiah 28. You're a neve shekher. We don't stone people like you to death anymore because we're under grace, not the law. But the sin is no less serious. You're a false teacher, John Wimber, and I can prove it. You got it wrong the last time. Why should we listen to you this time? But those who follow him are practicing rebellion. Call them to account. In this country, who's bringing it in? The same people who what? Who gave you the false predictions of an earthquake four years ago. Isn't it? Isn't it Ian Bilby and Elam? Even though the same people? Here's who's promoting it in your country. The same people who said an earthquake was coming four years ago. Ian Bilby, you misled God's people four years ago when you told them to follow Gerald Coates. Why should we follow you now? Australia, Phil Pringle. He said the world was going to end in 1988 on television. What does Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. The prophets prophesy falsely and my people love it so. This is rebellion. But God says, smash the golden cap and rub their face in it in public. He got it wrong the last time, Phil Pringle. He got it wrong the last time, John Wimber. He got it wrong the last time, Ian Bilby. He misled God's people before and you still haven't repented for what you did the last time. Why should you try to convince them to believe you now? That's biblical. They are misleading the church of Christ, people for whom Jesus died. They are leaders. They are responsible. Would the world let a medical doctor who's a quack, who's unqualified, go out and mutilate people? When they find out who he is, they take his license away. We sweep it under the rug. We have a lower standard than the world. God says no. Throw down the word of God. You smash up the golden calf and you rub their face in it. In public. That's what the Word of God says to do. But then what does Moses do? Get me Aaron. I want the leaders responsible. Who are the leaders? Get me Aaron. And what does Aaron say? Well, I don't know. I just threw in the gold and out came the calf. What do you think of that? <laughs> That's what an Aaron will always say. We have a letter from Wayne Hughes, the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God of New Zealand. He says the same thing. I just threw in the gold, out came the calf. Don't ask me, so what that I brought Rodney Brown into the country? So what that I endorsed his ministry? So what that I promoted him? I was out of the country when it happened. <laughs> I just threw in the gold, out came the calf says Aaron, says Wayne Hughes, there's nothing new under the sun. 
They always be. If you read the Bible, you can predict their behavior. You can actually predict what they'll do. Just like the Sanhedrin, the cowardice and hypocrisy of the Sanhedrin. They couldn't refute what Jesus said, so they attacked him for saying it. Once again on these cameras, Ian Doby, Wayne Hughes, I am here. I'll debate you in front of God's people. Bring your case, we'll watch the videos, and we'll see who's right. Let God's people decide. I challenge you people openly. I have nothing to hide, but you do. Here's the rug, there's the broom. Sweep it under. I'll deal with the facts. If you don't repent, by the grace of God, I'll rub your face in it. Not because I'm any better than you, I'm worse than you. I was a drug addict before I got saved, but Jesus saved me. And he didn't save me into a zoo, which is what you are turning his house into. Get me the leaders. That's what Moses said. And that's what I'm saying. Get me the leaders. Come on, Ian Bilby. Come on, Wayne Hughes. Come on, Phil Pringle. Debate me. But let's continue. What does Moses do next? The Hebrew is very interesting here. Verse 25. When Moses saw the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a division among their enemies. Do you see that? The Hebrew word for out of control is perua. You spell it the exact way you spell Pharaoh. A metaphor for the devil. These people are telling us the following lies. You'll know it by its fruit. Jesus never, ever, ever said you'd know a phenomena or an experience by its fruit. He said you'd know a person by their fruit. When you say you know a phenomena by its fruit, you are using a totally unbiblical basis of evaluating something of human invention. Any good fruit that somebody can show me out of this so-called blessing, I can show you bad fruits. You can show me a healed relationship, I can show you split marriages. You can show me people who've been exhilarated, I can show you ministers in psychiatric hospitals. You can show me churches that are alive again, I can show you split churches. It's an unbiblical basis of comparison. Secondly, Anything that anybody can testify because of somebody going to Toronto, what happened to them, I can show you a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness that'll tell you the same thing happened to them when they became members of a cult. Yeah, I have a greater hunger for the Word of God too. It is an unbiblical way of judging. Jesus never said you'd know something by its fruit. He said you'd know someone by its fruit. What Paul does in Galatians 5 is this. He explains, he uses the Hebrew way of reasoning, where you explain what something is, first of all, by explaining what it isn't. Before Paul explains what the fruit of the Spirit is, he says what it is not, which are the deeds of the flesh. Drunken behavior and a lack of self-control are deeds of the flesh. They are what the Bible says are the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. You know people by their fruit, and these people are parua. They are out of control. It is a deed of the flesh. A lack of self-control is of the flesh. The day of Pentecost, they were drunk. Peter says these men are not drunk. In his own epistle, he urges sobriety. Paul says you be sober in Timothy. Acts 2.11, I wish they would read it. You watch these videos and you hear drunken speech, literally like people coming out of a pub, stoned out of their mind on alcohol, falling down, rolling on the floor, groveling in their vomit, practically. You watch the videos. They're saying, this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. You'll find ministers unable to talk, going like this, just like they're drunk, unable to talk. However, Acts 2.11 says, on the day of Pentecost, the people heard the mighty deeds of God. They did not hear drunken speech. These people are lying to you. Once again, not only can they not read Greek or Hebrew, they can't even read English. Look at Peter's charisma. Look at his sermon. It was intelligent. It was cogent. It was coherent. It was scriptural. And it brought conviction. And thousands were saved, unlike with Toronto. 
Was Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost drunken speech? No, it was not. Drunken behavior and a lack of self-control are a deed of the flesh. Paul says it is a diametric opposite to the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to believe Toronto, throw the Bible out the window, then you can believe what you want. So let's look further. Parua, they become a derision in the face of their enemies. Once again, I believe and practice gifts of the Spirit. But Paul says if people see charismania instead of charismata in 1 Corinthians 14, 23, will they not say you are mad? What happened on 60 Minutes? They think we're nuts. You watch these videos. God forbid you should bring your unsaved families to see those videos. Your families would think we're nuts. It doesn't bring revival. It prevents it. We become a derision in the face of our enemies, it says. Because the people are parua, out of control, for their leaders, let them get parua. Their leaders, let them get out of control, and their enemies mock them. People are on their way to hell without Jesus. The only thing going to keep people from going to hell is the gospel. And the only messengers God has are us. When we become a mockery and a laughing stock in the eyes of a nation on its way to hell, a backslidden nation like this one that used to have a Christian heritage, this nation is finished. But instead of the church being the messengers of salvation and repentance, we become a derision, a laughing stock, because of men like Ian Bilby and Wayne Hughes who brought these clowns in. Tell them I said so I can prove it. People are going to hell. Your families are going to hell without Jesus. Oh, forever is a long time. Rodney Howard Brown began laughing. In his book, The Coming Revival, he says, I was preaching about eternal hell. And the more I described what hell was like, the more hysterically the people laughed. That's what Rodney Brown teaches. You have a father or a mother who died unsaved? How many people in here have a parent who's unsaved who died? Can you laugh? Can you think of what happened to your father? Can you laugh? Can you laugh? Well, my father died unsaved. I can't laugh either. But Rodney Howard Brown is laughing. And so is the devil. And so is Ian Bilby. Yes, I'm angry. Let's continue. Verse 26. What does Moses do next? Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the Levites come to him. He calls for division. He calls for division. We have a totally unbiblical view of unity. There's a true unity, which is the unity of the Spirit. And there's a false unity, which is the road to Babylon. Those people who compromise truth for the sake of some kind of ostensibly Christian unity with the Roman church are not on the road to unity of the spirit, they're on the road to Babylon. Watch out for promise keepers. It is an ecumenical organization. It is a formula for spiritual seduction also founded in the vineyard. Bill Sabritsky, he's a nice man, but the man is totally, totally ignorant of the teaching of the word of God. The way he sits on the radio, and I have a word for you, I have a word for you, Jeremiah 23 warns against that kind of thing. It says that is straw, not grain. Real prophets don't behave that way. Now he's into ecumenism. You cannot believe that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, and you're going to atone in purgatory for your own. You cannot believe the doctrines of Roman Catholicism and the Word of God. They're mutually exclusive. Any true believer in the Roman Catholic Church needs to come out the way they're coming out by the millions and millions and millions throughout Latin America and the Philippines. It is a false religion. It is a total bastardization of the Christian faith. That's the word, that's the term that fits. Unity of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, not error. You cannot have a unity of the Spirit based on error. It's impossible. But these people do. 1 Corinthians 11.19 There must be factions among you to prove which is true. The Greek word for factions, heresias, when we get the word heresy. Heresy, false doctrine, is supposed to bring division. Paul says, mark a factious man in Romans. 
That word in Greek is dikostasia. We get the word dichotomy. What was the factious man? One who departed from the teachings of the apostles. When people go away fundamentally from the teaching of the word of God, we're supposed to have a dikostasia, a division. Because there's two roads. One road forks off and goes to the unity of the spirit. The other goes to Babylon. That's reality. Moses called for a division. That's the way it is. Then what does Moses say? Verse 27, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword on his thigh. Go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp. Kill every man his brother, every man his friend, and kill every man his neighbor. 3,000 fell on that day of the people who wouldn't repent, who were obstinate. Thank God we're under grace, not law. The Hebrew word for sword is hedev. We don't go around with a literal sword stabbing people like John Wimber anymore. I'd much rather see people like that repent than be destroyed. And if there's something wrong in my life that's preventing me from being ready to meet Jesus, may God deal with me before I meet him. This is our sword. The sword of the Spirit. You pick up the sword and you use it, every man, against his brother, against his friend, and against his neighbor. Yes, your friends, your family, and your neighbors are into the golden calf. Pick up the sword and use it. You might lose your friend or your brother or your neighbor. Yes. Who's first? God or your social friendships? This is idolatry. But let's look what happens when you do it. Verse 29. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourselves today to the Lord. For every man has been against his son, against his brother, against his neighbor, in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. A blessing. You don't think of picking up the sword and using it on your friend or your neighbor or your brother as a blessing. But God will bring a blessing out of it. God is a God who brings good from evil. If you obey the word of God and pick up the sword, he'll bring a blessing. A real blessing. Not a Toronto blessing. He'll bring a real blessing. But you have to pick up the sword. We've had enough of these theocrats running around. Just like in Britain and Australia, there are very few leaders nowadays, mainly politicians. No more shepherds after God's own heart, just hirelings. It's time for the real leaders to stand up like Moses did and throw down the word of God. It's time for the real leaders to smash the golden calves and rub their face in it in public if they won't repent. It's time for the real leaders to confront the errant, the cop-out artists, the theocrats, the compromisers. I just threw in the gold. Out came the calf. Don't blame me, says Wayne Hughes. I was abroad at the time. It's time for the real leaders to call for a division. Why? Because Parua. Their leaders let them get out of control and would become a division in the eyes of our enemies. We're being mocked. That's why. Let's have a division. It's time to pick up the sword and use it. But if you do that, God will bring a real blessing. We're going to have a five-minute break. And then we're going to go on for another 15 minutes looking at the second story of the Golden Calf and Kings. And the second story of the Book of Kings of the Golden Calf is even more relevant to what's happening today than the first one. We'll go on for another 15 minutes or so, but first we have a five minute break. Video.
available that you can order if you're so interested in this kind of Bible teaching. I don't need to do this problem. Going around saying what's wrong, I try to emphasize more the positive, like you heard last night. But if you're interested, please put your name on the newsletter, and we have on the list, we'll be happy to send it to you. Open with me, please. The first Kings chapter 12, verse 25. First Kings 12, 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of the prime and lived there. And he went back from there and built Penuel. Penuel was the book of Jabbok was where Jacob wrestled with the message from the angel of the Lord, an Old Testament Christophany. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will be returned to the house of David. The kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will return to their Lord, even to the Abraham, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to the Abraham, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves, and he said to them, It's too much for you to walk to Jerusalem, the place where God has ordained worship. So they get into their own worship. Behold, your God, once again a golden calf always counts as fifty Yahweh. O Israel, and fought you up from the land of Egypt. And he sent one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now it says, Behold your God, the Hebrew word, there's no such thing as the Hebrew word for God. Hebrew has no word for God, it has God, Elohim. Here was where the Lord our God is one, here was where the Lord our God is unity. There's no such word as God in Hebrew, only God, only for we have one God, but he's a triune God in himself. Hebrew has no such word as God, only God. This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And he said, one is that now, which means the house of God, and the other he put in man. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as man. And he made houses on the high places, and he made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. That's an important verse we'll come back to. And Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he made. And he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high place which he made. Then he went up to the altar which he made in Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, a counterfeit of one of the Jewish holidays that God did with him. Even in the month he devised his own heart, and he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel, and he went up to the altar to burn his face. Except for Hosea, all the prophets that went to Israel, the northern ten tribes, were from Judah. Sort of like the difference between a good church and a bad church, Israel and Judah. Although Judah eventually was brought himself before the captivity. This is what begins to happen. <coughs> God ordained worship to take place in Jerusalem and Mount Zion. But the king has a vested interest in keeping the people worshiping in an unbiblical location, in an unbiblical way. He built his personal empire on it. What you see today is the same thing. We have a tape called the Second Sin of David, in which we describe a look at how people have turned their ministry into a business, have turned their calling into a career. And instead of building the kingdom of God, they build their personal empire. In Pentecostal circles particularly, many of the people doing it are people doing it who could not otherwise become successful in the secular world. They couldn't become barristers or engineers or scientists or doctors or dentists or business people or, or, or skilled or labor or anything like this. So they turned the ministry into the vehicle or having the success that they couldn't get in the world. You find this so often in the Pentecostal ministry particularly. The leaders are people who wouldn't be good enough to make it in the world. So the ministry becomes the vehicle to try to make it. I'm not saying all of them, but certainly a good deal of them. They built their empire on wrong worship, on hype. Look at the hymn books, songs of praise. They're all copywritten, those songs, aren't they? Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Not typical. Phil Pringle, let's call down the fire. 
Isaiah 50 says God will judge people who do that. Not biblical. They built their career on wrong worship. They built their empires on hype instead of anointing. They have a vested interest in perpetuating it. So what does this king say? Don't let the people go back to biblical worship because they'll see right through my game and they'll stop following me and I'll be out of business. Is that what he says? <coughs> These people are terrified of you to go back to the word of God. There is no doxology without theology. There is no right worship without right doctrine. But they don't want right doctrinal theology because they built their empires on wrong theology. Or perhaps more accurately described, no theology. But let's continue. They're building the house of God when they built it. Now look what happens. Verse 31. He made houses at high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. To be in the ministry, you had to be called to it. He said to Aaron, a son of Levi. The Kohanim had the Levites, the priests. To be in full-time ministry or in leadership, you must be called to it. This guy begins to appoint people to appoint people as ministers who are not called to the ministry. You understand? They appoint cronies. Again, there are no leaders, only politicians. Things are increasingly wrong on the basis of theocratic expediency. We'll make him a house group leader. He don't even say nine months, yeah, but you know, gotta give him something to do to keep him in the church. They begin appointing their cronies. And then these guys build houses on the high places. They wind up with a vested material interest in keeping the cronyism going. So perpetuating the crony system becomes more important than the integrity of God's word. I'm loyal to the name, he appointed me. I'm a member of this denomination and like on the outcome, he led me to my control. This is what happens. They appoint cronies. Now again, if it was up to me, I would leave the ministry tomorrow. I never wanted to do that at all. If you want to come on a tour in this while, you can help support my secular business. <laughs> <laughs> my ambition is to be full time in the ministry but not be paid for it. That's my ambition. And I'm not doing that now. What will it be? Okay. Nothing wrong with being paid for the ministry if God has called him to it. But they wind up appointing people who God did not call to it. They appoint cronies. Today, the charismatic and Pentecostal leadership runs mainly on cronyism. It says in 1 Timothy, the qualifications of a pastor of a leader, he must be able to teach. I do not know of, I could be wrong, but I do not know of a single human minister in New Zealand who is biblically qualified to be a minister. I do not know of a single human pastor in this country who is biblically qualified to be a pastor by the standard of the person. I don't know of a single one. They appoint their cronies. But then what happens? They make their own celebrations praise. Don't go away, stay here. They don't want people going to where biblical worship is practiced. They have a vested financial interest in it. They build their houses on it. Let's continue. What does this mean for you? Look at chapter 13. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense to his golden altar. And he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, Mesabeah, Mesabeah, O altar, altar. Thus says the Lord, Behold, the son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And here, of course, is a mathematic typology of the Jesus. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. <coughs> then he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split asunder, and the ashes that are on it poured out. 
Now it came about when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried out against the altar of Bethel, that Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. But his hand which he stretched out against him dried up, so he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was split asunder, and the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand became restored to him, and it became as it was before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I'll give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you. Nor would I eat bread or drink water with you in this place, for so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way which he came to Bethel, the house of God. Now an old prophet was living in Bethel, and his son came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day. In Bethel, the words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Let us drink here. You confront these people about the golden past, but when they take one step backwards, they take two steps forward. And they say, come on with me, be my friend, come to my house where the golden cat is. In England, I had lunch with the general superintendent of the biggest Christian, uh, Pentecostal denomination, Kilo, who promote Horace Murillo with the 25 pound British Holy Ghost miracle handkerchief guaranteed to take away all debt. That was last year. This year, they're promoting Morris Murillo who's selling the Toronto blessing for 25 pounds. It was 60, but on his fundraising literature, there's an X through the 60, and it's marked down to 25. The Holy Ghost is on sale this week, and he even promotes it. <laughs> he takes a step backwards, but then he comes right back down and does the same thing. Come to my house, come have lunch with the executive. <laughs> Get rid of the golden cat, they want to have a picnic. The first thing these people do when you stand up to them is what? Quick! See him! They try to grab you. But it doesn't work, they get paralyzed. How could this film with myself in this country? I'm the Assemblies of I know the Assemblies of God Church in England. Up and down this country, the Assemblies of God leadership try to close doors to me, keep away from him, keep away from him, keep away from him. You understand? To every door they close, God opens too. I have to come back again in March, April because I can't take all the invitations. I won't be talking about this in March, April too much, but uh, that's the way it comes. They get power off. They can't stop you. They're afraid of you telling the truth. Paul calling out against their altar with the Lord. But look what happens with the paralysis. She took. As you'll see on the video, one of the most common phenomena associated with the Toronto thing is she took paralysis. Every place paralysis happens in the Bible is a divine judgment. I don't know. Only that calling it a blessing. What's the scripture say? Curse the evil, call the evil, good is the evil. She took. It's either demonic or it's a judgment, but it's never a blessing. Come on home with us. Let's be friends. See, if they can't see you, they try to fly you off. Play pitch. If they have a golden cat, don't go home with you. But look what happens next. Now, an old prophet was living in Bethel, and his son came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done. That day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken to the king. These also they related to their father, and their father said to them, Which way did he go? Now his sons had seen the way which the man of God who came from Judah had come. Then he said to his son, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode away on it. So he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak, and said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you. 
nor go with you, nor I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord, you shall eat no bread nor drink water with them. Do not return there. Return by going the way which you came. Do not go another way. And he said to him, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. And these people of the Roman Catholic lie. I can show you in the book Catch the Fire, prefaced by John Arnett, written by Jaisio, the man actually lies. He tells people that uh, this happened with uh, <coughs> Daniel Rowland in the great revival in Britain. Except when you read Daniel Rowland's book, Daniel Rowland and George Woodfield said it was from the devil. They were actually lying. These people in Toronto have to go up in your church lie. Make no mistake, they will lie. I can prove they lie. I can prove in print they lie. So he went back with him, and he ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it came about as they were sitting down at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who brought him back, and cried to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you disobeyed the commands of the Lord, and have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the grave of your father. This is the Hebrew concept of a boat, being gathered to the father. It's sort of an old testament typology of, of, of going to heaven or salvation when you die. <clears throat> and it came about after he had eaten the bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, for the prophets whom he brought back. Now I'm not saying this man didn't go to heaven, I'm simply talking about the typology of the above, not necessarily not the man. Now when he's gone, a lion met him on the way, pay attention and killed him. His body was thrown on the road with the donkey standing next to it, the lion also was standing next to the corpse. And behold, man passed and saw the body thrown on the road, and the lion standing next to the corpse. So they came and told him in the city where the old prophet lived. Now when the prophet who brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord, therefore the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke. Then he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me, and they saddled it. The reference here was Jeremiah 22, 19. And he went and found his corpse thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing next to the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. That's important. So the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back and came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his corpse in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came about after he buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I die, bury me in the grave which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones next to his bones. For the thing shall surely come to pass which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria. After this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way, but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people, any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. And this event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from the face of the earth. Once again, they don't repent, they keep going. You can warn them and warn them, but they keep going. They get obsessed by a golden calf. These people have staked their careers on it. They staked their reputations on Toronto. No revival is coming from it. They know no revival will come, but they can't stand up and face that. They can't admit they were wrong and made a mistake. What will happen is, remember, Toronto was not the beginning. Before Toronto was Kansas City. After Toronto, who knows what will be next? They have to get one thing after another. One deception in waves after another. These deceptions come in waves. They can never admit they were wrong. They just keep going with the deception. Now the first time he says, No, I'm not going home with you. I will not eat and drink where a golden path is worship. I won't go to your church. And he's under an oak. An oak is the strongest tree in the Middle East. He's in a place of strength. <clears throat> Be careful when you're in a place of strength. If you stand up to these people and challenge them, they'll try to grab you, but they'll be paralyzed. You'll be in a place of strength. But what Paul says is, when you're strong, he who thinks he's strong and take he's going to fall. Where, in certain ways, more vulnerable, 
the deception when we're in place of strength than when we are in place of weakness. Be careful when you're in a place of strength. Thank God that's where you are, but stay under that tree. This time he lets himself get seduced. Oh, I'm a prophet like you and I heard from the Lord. You're not into spiritual pride, are you? You don't think your church is the only one that has it right? You don't think that we don't hear from Jesus as well? Well, we accept that you have a yeah, word from the Lord, but you don't think you're the only one who's you. I heard from the Lord too. You're not into pride, are you? <laughs> when there's a golden calf, don't believe it. They're lying. It's a lying spirit. That's what he gets to do. <clears throat> An alliance means this. A lion is normally a picture of one of two things in the Bible. There are certain exceptions, but normally it's one of two things. In Peter, Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. A lion is frequently a picture of Satan. But this lion does not devour. Zoologically, a lion will kill for self-defense or for food. It will devour its prey. This lion does not devour the prey, does not attack the donkey. He behaves contrary to the natural behavior of a lion. He does not devour. It is not Satan. It is not the devouring lion of Peter. This lion is the lion of Judah. It's Jesus. Turn to the second Thessalonians. Judah will 
speak to it personally. But it doesn't have to be like that. God forbid it shouldn't be like that. Jesus loves us. But if we don't love the truth, we don't love Him. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you what God's Word says. If you're in a church and they have a golden calf, don't eat or drink in it. You raise your voice against it. There's no place for you to drink it. If you're in a church that's gone into this deception, God wants you to do one of two things. Stand up and fight, or stand up and leave. But don't stay and pretend it's all right. Call out against that altar. Now, if you do that, the likelihood is you'll be thrown out. But you'll be in good company. <laughs> Before I was a Christian, I was thrown out of pubs, rock concerts, four houses, my clubs, you name it, I was thrown out. Since I don't Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I get thrown out of church. <laughs> <laughs> The early Jewish Christians never wanted to leave the synagogue, ever. <clears throat> but they wouldn't compromise the truth of God's word, so they were thrown out and were forced to leave. John Wesley never wanted to leave the church of England, <clears throat> but he wouldn't compromise the truth of God's word, so he was forced out of the church of England, the same as the early Jewish Christians were forced out of the synagogue. The reformers tried to change the Roman Catholic Church from within. They never wanted to read any book about them. But they wouldn't compromise the truth of God's words they were forced out. If you're in a church like this, you have a choice. You either compromise and follow the false prophets and wind up in the same grave with them. Or you cry out against the author. Stand up and fight or stand up and leave. But don't go eat and drink in that house. No? They're worshiping a golden cat. If you led somebody to Christ, could you bring them into your church to be discipled and nurtured in the ways of the Lord according to the Word of God? Now, if your church is in Toronto, you obviously couldn't when you watch these videos tomorrow. If you can't bring a newly saved person that you lead to Christ into your church to be discipled, you better find another church. There are good churches and bad churches. Now, I meet mean, a lot of people around New Zealand the same as they do abroad. That they, they're so frustrated and disgusted by what happened that they don't go to church anymore. The solution to a bad church is a good church, not a no church. The solution to the problem of a bad church is a good church, not a no church. Hebrews 10.25 to say not the fellowshipping together, especially to be the day of Moses. As we see the signs of Jesus returning, right fellowship becomes increasingly important. That's called cover the holder in Midrash. That's a subject. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But if your church is into a golden cat, don't eat that. Don't drink that. Just call out against that wall. God bless you. The power of sin and death. But the man already was born again, so he couldn't be talking about that. Then most of the people who are involved in all of the people are already charismatic to Pentecostals. They're already people who claim to be baptized in the Spirit or have had a spirit baptism. So they obviously can't be talking about spirit baptism. Thirdly, it's not a revival, so I must ask, what is it? And the answer I usually get is Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a charismatic. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but I practice them. But the text does not say that a time of refreshing precedes repentance. It says that repentance precedes refreshing. No place does the Word of God say that a refreshing is the predecessor of revival. No place. Not even one place. It says the opposite. First comes the repentance, then God will refresh you. Again, it's bad enough that these people can't read Greek or Hebrew, but they can't even read English. More than that, in the verse, in the context, Peter is talking to unsaved people, not to Christians. 
The whole thing is absurd. Absolutely absurd. What is it? Well, anyway, he was angry that I said anybody who reads a verse like this is behaving like a moron. And I found out later they were grumbling because they couldn't refute what I said, that uh, Jesus said, call no man fool. I didn't say fool, I said moron. M-O-R-O-N. Fool is raka in Aramaic. As in the fool says in his heart there is no God. I didn't say these people are atheists. I said, what, what Paul said, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? And believe me, these people caught up in these things you'll see tomorrow on the videos are being bewitched. They're being spiritually seduced, the Hebrew term, makshafut. In any event, let us look at the golden calf that Philip read from Exodus chapter 32. We have to understand the first thing about a golden calf is it is always an alien spirit pretending to be Yahweh. A golden calf is always an alien spirit, a foreign god, something demonic, pretending to be the true God. This is the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. They confused the golden calf with Yahweh. A better example is what happened with the priests of Baal. In the Baal worship of the ancient Near East, which was a Canaanite fertility cult, once again, a calf becomes a picture of their God, who they confuse with Yahweh. The priest of Baal did not begin worshipping this Canaanite Baal. Let me give you a brief lesson in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew word for husband is Baal. Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal. The true Baal of heaven, Baal Shemaim, was Yahweh. But the, he, the priests of Baal, under the influences of Jezebel, who's a picture of the spirit of false religion in Revelation, begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way. You begin to worship the true God in an unbiblical way. That's how Baal worship began. They didn't begin worshipping a foreign Baal, they began worshipping the true one, Yahweh, but instead of worshipping him on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, where God ordained, they began worshipping him, rather, in what we call in Hebrew, Bein Mot, high places. And another spirit, an alien spirit, got in and began counterfeiting the true God. That's what happened. That's what always happens. Now again, Leviticus chapter 10 calls this burning strange fire. And I was astounded that, the, uh, that, that, that a member of the executive of the Assemblies of God in Australia, Philip, Philip Hills, actually says a little bit of strange fire is better than no fire. I wish he'd read the book of Leviticus. But God says that's dangerous and it will bring judgment. But this is what the Assemblies of God is teaching these days in Australia. First Corinthians 4, 6 says, Do not exceed the things which are written. Don't do that. Paul says it directly. However, about a month before last, John Wimber said, there is no biblical basis for what is happening at the Airport Vineyard Church in Toronto. This is what John Wimber, the leader of the Vineyard, says. We should just accept it anyway. And who are you going to believe? The Word of God or, or John Wimber, the leader of the Vineyard? They're saying things that are contradictory. Once you exceed the things that are written, you fall into man-made doctrine. That's what Laodicea means, people's opinions. We talked about that last night. You begin worshipping the true God in an unbiblical way, and an alien spirit gets in. The priests of Baal were unable to make the real fire fall. It didn't happen. Now, Elijah made it fall. He rebuilt something we call in Hebrew, Mesabeach, the ancient altar. Hebrews lets us know that an altar in the Old Testament is a type of the cross of Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, and when he dies on the cross, that is prefigured in the Old Testament by the high priest making atonement on the altar. Elijah was able to make the fire fall. How? He rebuilt the ancient altar. Any time the fire ever fell in the history of the church, it was because of the preaching of the cross. That was always the central message. The early Pentecostals, the fire really fell. Large numbers were saved. But what was their message? Was their message the Holy Spirit? No, it wasn't. Was the message signs and wonders? No, it wasn't. The message of early Pentecostalism was this power, power, wonder-working power and the blood of the land. They preached the cross. 
John Wesley, his whole message was holiness, repentance, the cross. The book of Acts, this Jesus whom you crucified. It has no resemblance to what you see today. In Wesley's revivals, in the book of Acts, and early Pentecostalism, huge numbers of people were being saved. That is not happening now. On the contrary, when unsaved people see 60 Minutes or the BBC and they see these excesses, it makes them want to not become Christians rather than causing them to want to become Christians. It prevents revival. It doesn't bring it. If the unsaved enter, well, between the Jewish feast of Pesach, Passover, and the Jewish feast of weeks, Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. The rabbis tell us that the Torah was given on the day of Pentecost. The same day the Holy Spirit was given is when the Torah was given to Moses when this happened. Now you have to understand that. This period is when the Jews have made so many of their biggest mistakes, such as following a false messiah who's the type of the Antichrist called Simon Bar Kokhba. They made a lot of mistakes at this time period. But this is the first. Moses tells the people at this time in the Jewish year, the same time of year, you wait, I'm going to get something. Jesus tells his disciples, you wait, I'm going to get something. Same time. The rabbis tell us in the Talmudic literature that when the Torah was given, they deduced it somehow from the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 that a whirlwind was heard from heaven. And 30 tongues, Lashonot, were heard when the Torah was given. So the phenomena of tongues, glossolalia in Greek, is heard in the Old Testament when, tongue, when the Torah is given, according to the rabbis. And when the New Testament comes, and the Holy Spirit is given, the same phenomena recurs. Tongues. Only the difference being the following. When the Torah was given, 3,000 fell. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. You understand? The right action of the apostles is seen as a reversal of the wrong action of Aaron and the children of Israel. You understand? The early Christians understood tongues partly this way. They saw it as a partial reversal of the curse of Babel, the Tower of Babel. God's judgment came separating nations on the basis of language. But through unity in Christ, that unity is partly restored. That's how they understood tongues in part in the early church. Now, the Torah is given and 3,000 fall, the Spirit is given, 3,000 are saved. Moses tells the children of Israel, wait, but they get rambunctious. And instead of waiting for the real thing, they make a golden calf. Something which is an alien spirit counterfeiting the true God. The apostles, however, wait. God's definition of waiting, however, is very, very different than ours. Our definition of waiting works like this. Hanging around, waiting for a train, drinking coffee, when's the train coming? God's version of waiting is entirely different. His version of waiting always entails action. Always. Being faithful to what you already have. First of all, it's prayer. The apostles were given to prayer and fasting, waiting for the Spirit to fall. Our prayer and fasting will always be a factor in what happens in the heavenlies, as we see in the book of Daniel. We have a role to play in God's dynamic. Now, some people go overboard with this and get into all kinds of crazy teaching, like Peter Wagner, but that's nuts. There is a biblical truth, however. Now, secondly, God's idea of waiting always entails being faithful to what you already... I not say you are mad, as we'll look at that tonight. Elijah made the fire fall by going back to the ancient altar. The only way real revival will come, that real Holy Ghost fire will fall and purify and bring... Revival to the church in this nation and restore it to any degree to its biblical heritage as the people go back to the cross. But these people don't want the cross. Just look at the videos tomorrow and see for yourself. They could be less interested in the cross. Their message is not the one of Wesley. It's not the one of early Pentecostalism. It's not the one of the book of Acts. Instead, it's the priests of Baal. They had their cast, so they ranted and raved and tried to make the fire fall. They ranted and raved and behaved like lunatics. But the fire didn't fall. So they ranted and raved some more and behaved like lunatics even more excessively. 
and the fire didn't fall. And if you want to see lunatics, come and see the videos tomorrow that we watched this afternoon. Just like the priests of Baal, they can't make the fire fall, so they behave like lunatics. They had a calf cult. It was a calf. Golden calves spring up many times in Israel's history because they spring up many times in the history of the church. As we looked at this afternoon, the early Christians called Toronto-type phenomena Montanism. During the Reformation, the Munster Anabaptists did the same things in Germany, the same kind of nuttiness. The founders of the Quakers, George Fox's followers, the witness of the inner light and the quaking, it was the same thing. None of this is new. None of it. In vineyard churches in the United States, the same thing was going on 10, 12 years ago. Only then they said it was deliverance from demons. Now they're saying they made a mistake 10 years ago. It's the Holy Ghost. None of it's new. None of it. Absolutely none of it is without precedent. Many golden calves. Second Kings 10.29, a golden calf. Hosea 8, 5 and 6, a golden calf. Ho uh, Hosea 13.2, a golden calf. The Montanists, a golden calf. The Munster Anabaptists, a golden calf. They always spring up at pivotal times in church history. None of this is without precedent. It's in the Old Testament and it's throughout history of the church as well as the history of Israel. But tonight we're going to look at two stories of golden calves, the two main ones, the one in Exodus, then we'll have a five-minute break, and we'll look at, Lord willing, the one in Kings. This calf worship, the bull cults, in Egypt were associated with the worship of Apis and Nevis. But in the land of Goshen, where the Jews were captive, it was associated with Horus worship. In Canaan, it became associated with Baal worship. We have to understand what exactly is happening here when Moses goes to get the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This period of time, when Moses goes to get the Ten Commandments, is called in Judaism the Sira, literally the counting. It is the period... Good evening. We had an interesting meeting this afternoon, mainly for leaders and their wives. And uh, I talked about something which uh, is, is an objective fact. I make no God of education or theological education. I know people with theological educations that are on their way to hell. They're not even saved. You don't need a theological education in the academic sense to be a minister. But you do need to know the Word of God. If somebody is unable to rightly divide the Word of God, they have no business whatsoever being a minister. That's what the Word of God says in First Timothy. No business whatsoever. Now, I'm not against theological education, but... I was a, a missionary in the Middle East for years without one. I studied science as a kid. Only when I was older did I go to Britain and become educated in academic theology. I did know Hebrew, of course, but that was just a plus, a natural plus I had. I learned Greek and things like that later. In any event, it is an objective fact that the standards of education and biblical knowledge among Pentecostal and charismatic ministers are very, 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 very low. Extremely low. You're not simply dealing with men who are by and large uneducated academically. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is you're dealing with people who have never been taught the Word of God. The old-time Pentecostals were. They knew their Bibles and their doctrines much better. That's by and large gone now. This afternoon we had a minister who took exception when he saw the videos you're going to see tomorrow. We showed the videos of Rodney Brown and Kenneth Copeland and crazy things from around the world which we'll be showing here tomorrow. We'd certainly encourage you to join us and bring your friends. And he couldn't deny what he saw, and I pointed out that the Pentecostal leadership in this country, including the Pentecostal leadership of his denomination, which was apostolic, brought this in. And he became very angry and disturbed until Philip held up the brochure showing that the general superintendent of the apostolic denomination endorsed Rodney Brown and was one of the people who brought him into this country. I mean, again, if you can't refute the message, you shoot the messenger. <laughs> just like the Sanhedrin I couldn't deal with what Jesus said and then he was angry because I, I looked at Acts 3.19 and I said let's look at Acts 3.19 which is what they're all saying you see they have a problem 
The problem with the proponents of the Toronto phenomena, their first problem is they don't know what it is or how to define it biblically. They must admit that it's been around in America for going on three years, and Britain for two years, Australia for two years, New Zealand for two years, and it hasn't brought a real revival in the sense of Wesley's revivals or anything else. So they can't say it's a revival, but they admit that. Originally they said it was a revival, as you'll see in the videos tomorrow. Now they're saying it's not a revival, it's a time of refreshing. They've had to try to redefine it. And you'll see people on the videos tomorrow saying, if God can do this for me, if he can give it to me, well, I ask, what is it? First of all, you know, what is it? This one man up there in, in the airport vineyard church in Toronto was saying, if God can set me free. Well, set free of what? You can use the term set free when somebody's born again. We're set free.